Hi, I'm David. Hi, I'm Yelena. And welcome to our tutorial on breath and bandhas. It just means we're going to talk quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a talky tutorial. tutorial. Um, what are bandhas? Banda means lock or fetter. Fetter? It's such an old word. Um, so it's a, a way that we uh, hold our body and then um, really actually contain and direct energy. Mm -hmm. Energy. So Banda has sort of two components to it. There's this physiological component. Wait. Before you go on, <laughs> do you want to hear more? <laughs> <laughs> then you have to like it, comment, <laughs> and subscribe. Subscribe. And, uh, and let us know, please, uh, if anything else you want to see in the future. We'll, we do read the comments, and, um, and we will make a video for you. Okay, yes. sorry. So going back to bandhas, they have sort of two components to them. There's this physiological um, side of it, which is purely the muscle engagement. And it sounds simple because you think, oh, it's a muscle, I can get to it. But it's quite hard it's and it, it takes a lot of work to develop a connection to these muscles, even though we use them all the time, but to develop this more intimate connection with them because those are the muscles that are deep inside of us. So they're really, really internal muscle and we use them um, in unconscious way all the time. So bringing consciousness into how we use them is a bit tricky. And then on the other side, this is what David was talking about in a second, there's this um, energetic, this spiritual component to bandhas. What we're going to do in this tutorial is mainly talk about the physiological or just the muscle engagement that happens when we use our bandhas. The spirituality or the energetic side of the bandhas we'd like you to discover on your own. It's something that comes with time and patience and practice and self-inquiry. Yeah, I don't know. I even think uh, maybe I would make a distinction between energetic and spiritual too. Yes. Um, but there, in in yoga, in generally, um, there is uh, there's a lot of different approaches. Put it that way, to um, to how we can influence the the bodies because we have many bodies. We have the the physical body. We have uh, an emotional body. We have a mental body, we have an energetic body, etc. So um, we're going to stay pretty superficial, right, talking about this. But really, you can't influence just one. You can't work on just one level. And that, that, is, that is yoga mm -hmm. or uh, hatha yoga, you know, in a nutshell, that anything that you do with your physical body is going to have an effect mm -hmm. all the way through. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, bandha means lock, and we have mula bandha. Mula means root, and this is the hand gesture that accompanies it um, because it's described as squeezing the anus. So, you can imagine. Um, <laughs> so, uh, it's gross, sorry. Uh, but um, basically, it is contracting the pelvic floor. And, um, and then we have Udhyana Bandha. Udhyana means to lift up, to fly up. And that is the uh, lower belly and um, correlates with the transverse abdominus muscles. The, these are the muscles that run laterally around the waist. Um, so we're working with two Bandhas. Uh, in in the asanas and in the practice of Ashtanga We yoga. should mention also that there is Jalandhara Bandha. Casting the net across the stream. You love saying that. I do. So poetic. <laughs> Which is basically a lock that we create here in our throat. But this is a Bandha that we don't use in our asana practice. Um, we use this when we do kumbhaka in pranayama only, so seated breathing exercises, when we find this lock and when we actually engage all of three bandhas, which is called maha bandha. Maha, the great, the great um, lock, the great seal. But again, in terms of our asana practice, we are only coming to uh, mula bandha and uriyana bandha. And... Uh... 
it's interesting. If you read Yoga Mala, which is Patabi Joyce's book on, um, on Ashtanga's primary series, he, he, does, he doesn't talk so much about the bandhas, like too much about it, um, but he, he does say sometimes they should be released and sometimes they should be engaged. You know, there's a, there are a couple of poses where he says, activate Uddiyana Bandha, but release Mula Bandha, or, you know, something like that. Very, very uh, esoteric and strange. Which is quite hard, actually, when we start going through little exercises to get you to um, go more internal. You'll notice that when you engage one, Mula Bandha, Uddiyana Bandha just accompanies it almost immediately. So trying to do one but let go of the other seems... Uh, Another level. Yeah. Mysterious. So uh, let's, let's stay away from the mystery a little bit and just talk about uh, the physical contractions. So um, I think uh, that probably we experience Mula Bandha slightly differently, um, uh, men and women, or depending on your uh, whatever anatomy you're working with down there. Um, so uh, for me, um, then the, the contraction is, uh, is between the anus and the genitals, and I can feel movement around the genitals. Sorry, is this TMI? Um, so one of the ways that we can talk about the, that activation is, um, is if you imagine walking into very cold water. You know when you're at the lake or somewhere and the water's super cold, but you gotta go in, and you're tiptoeing in and you're trying to stay as high as you can, but you get to that spot, and then you're just trying to keep your junk out of the water just a little bit more. Even as I'm describing it, I bet you're doing it just sympathetically, right? So that, that lift is Mula Bandha. Okay, and you can, you can be quite, active about it, or you can be quite subtle about it once you start to uh, uh, get more control over the muscles. Um, actually, I do the exact same thing when I walk into the lake uh, that's very cold or the ocean. And so that lifting is just felt a little bit different for us. So for me, that is a little bit more forward. And actually, I feel it through the lift of my kegels, which are the muscles inside the walls of the vagina. So you feel that lift coming a um, little bit more forward. Like that would be more of an epicenter for it. Another way that you can relate to that is when you simply go and pee. And so being able to stop your flow is the engagement of the pelvic floor muscles. Now. Do not practice connecting with your pelvic floor muscles by going to the bathroom and stopping your flow. It is really, really bad for you, and it can disrupt the connection between your brain and all the nervous um, nerves in that area. You can do it once if you just want to focus and stop the flow to kind of get with that engagement, but then later on you're going to do Kegel exercises if you need to reconnect. I always picture that sprinkler that, <laughs> you know. That. No, don't do that. <laughs> uh, so uh, I was saying you can, um, you can be very contracted or you can be lightly contracted. We have to assume that we're all lightly contracted all the time in, if we're continent, if we're able to hold our, you know, our pee and our poop in. That's because we learned how to activate the bandhas when we were uh, children you know, potty training. So we, we are exercising some control all the time, but now what we want to do is be able to go deeper into that contraction. And again, to take any mystery out of this, think about how you feel when you really have to go to the bathroom, but there's no bathroom anywhere around. You know that the engagement down there has now drastically changed versus you just sitting here now watching this video. So that there is this range, which is no different from any other muscle in your body. You can engage it slightly or you can really engage it when you need to power up some. Mm -hmm. And um, what you'll notice, if you can get subtle enough, and I know if you haven't been doing this, it can sound like out there or, or like too esoteric or too imaginable, but it's, it's real. 
Okay, this is a real thing. So if you sit like I'm sitting, uh, kneeling, or you can sit uh, like Yellen is sitting, cross leg, that's fine too. But just, you can close your eyes maybe, and so you can tune inward, or you can stare at me while you do this too. <laughs> and you, uh, you're going to try to do that feeling of squeezing. So imagine you have to go to the bathroom and you squeeze. Can you feel any influence in your hips? So if you relax it, don't relax it all the way. Don't want any accidents, but if you relax and then go to the contraction again, can you feel any movement around the sits bones, around the bottom of your pelvis? I'll tell you what I feel. When I activate through the pelvic floor, I feel my sits bones draw down and towards each other. Okay, you wanna try that again? So you're just sitting, relax, and then squeeze. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. And just notice the influence that it has over the hips. And now bring your awareness a little bit forward around the pubic bone. You know, the very lowest, lowest part of your belly, the pubic bone, below the belly, really. And then again, squeeze, 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 squeeze. You might be able to feel the pubic bone drawing back almost towards the sacrum, towards the, the back of the hips. Okay, this is what we're looking for in terms of creating support in the body with the bandhas and it, even a shape that is going to give you um, superpowers when it comes to your asanas and your vinyasas. So what makes bandhas or this engagement in this area of the body so important is that it provides a connection with your upper body and your lower body. Or another way, kind of the epicenter of the, your whole body moves somewhere into this region. And then the way you move um, allows you to feel like your weight is much more distributed evenly throughout the body. So you don't feel overwhelming pressure in your shoulders or even your wrists, even if you happen to be in bakasana and balancing. Or you don't feel all the weight on your legs, even though you're in utkatasana and the knees are bent and you feel like your legs are on fire, but there's this kind of coming back to this center that makes the work seem lighter too. Yeah, it definitely creates lightness and it connects the uh, lower body and the upper body together. Yeah. So we'll show you in another tutorial how that can help you with floating, mm -hmm. um, you know, the jumping through and jumping back lately. And if you're thinking like, oh my God, that's so much, I have to think about this. Well, yes, this is part of your mindfulness practice. You want to make this very conscious, and this is part of the focus. This is what keeps pulling you back inwards. Yeah. So you, you have this kind of uh, this low setting for your bandhas. Like we said, you were trained when you were a kid, a baby, how to, uh, how to hold there, and we're always holding that. But the level of activation that we're talking about now is very intentional. So you need to keep coming back to it. And you'll notice as we're talking, you'll let go of it and then we'll mention it and you'll, you'll contract again. Doing that again and again strengthens the overall tone that you'll get down there. So just through practicing that contraction again and again, you'll, that's active, but over, over time, more strength begins to develop, just your, your kind of um, uh, base level strength. And if you're having a hard time connecting to the, that part for whatever reason, it could be a trauma to the body, it could be childbirth, it could be whatever has happened that's kind of created numbness or block, that's okay. You just have to start really slow. So in your practice, you keep coming back to this and you keep thinking about it and reaching for it. And that's going to start to create new pathways and new connections. And then also another really good exercise is to just simply go and lie on your bed or sit in the chair and placing your hands on this part of the body, trying to kind of come back, trying to find that lift. And so just palms on the belly will slowly start to get that connection because you're gonna start to feel that there is a very slight movement in the belly which connects to the movement within. Yeah, and really this is where we're starting to go into Wudiyana Bandha, the lifting lock as well. Remember, it's a different muscle group, so we're not talking about the pelvic floor anymore. Now we're coming up a little bit higher, 
and the transverse abdominis come all the way down and they do come onto the pubic bone as well. So you can feel um, that same activation in the lower belly when you're drawing the pubic bone back through activation in the, in the uh, pelvic floor. So they are kind of related that way. What we want to do then for Uddiyana Bandha is just go a little deeper, just go a little bit further into that contraction. And so remember this is Mula Bandha. Uddiyana Bandha is like this. It's almost like you're drawing from the center of your belly out towards your hip bones. That's how I feel, like mm -hmm. a, it's a hollowing. And you want to keep it quite low. And again, you'll feel an influence in your hips and in your lower back where it starts to flatten your lower back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So again, just to be specific, here's my belly button and here's my pubic bone. So this epicenter is quite low. That's why when we teach, we always say lower belly. We're staying really low. And so for me, I feel this, what David's talking about, this kind of drawing out of my muscle towards my hip bones. And so here, if I fully relax, and when I engage them, for me, it feels like from my pubic bone to that point, I'm just rolling the belly in. Like, it's like a little wave, and then it stops at that point. And then here, I try to keep it as soft as possible. Of course, it's gonna impact these muscles here, but we're not trying to pull it in like you're taking a photo or walking on the beach. It's just very low, gentle roll inwards yeah. and outwards. Depending kind of on what you're doing too, because yeah. some, sometimes it'll be more strong. Mm -hmm. um, and so the bandhas, usually everybody wants to know about them because it seems kind of magical. Like if you could just do it, then you'll be able to float, you'll be whatever, you'll be able to do deeper asana practice. But um, we don't talk about it too much as in an isolated way at the beginning because it takes a long time just to develop the capacity to kind of connect with them and things. But they are important, um, even, even just in a very general way, for uh, doing the correct breathing in Ashtanga Yoga, which is free breathing with sound. So free breathing with sound is an empowered thoracic breath, which means that we're not doing lower belly breathing, which you do in lots of other styles of yoga. And that's, that's just different instructions, different approaches. But because of the vinyasa and the, the fairly um, uh, active nature of Ashtanga Yoga, you know, it's pretty intense sometimes, then we're keeping the lower belly active throughout the practice. And by doing that, we're pushing the breath up. We're not letting the diaphragm and the breath come all the way down. And that also creates some heat in your body too. So with free breathing, with sound, comes this like uh, warming up in the body because the diaphragm is going to have to resist a little bit into the contraction in the lower belly. And uh, free breathing with sound, the sound comes from that slight close that you make in the throat, right? You're gently closing the glottis because not to create the sound, but to limit the air as it comes in and out you want to make the inhalation the same duration as the exhalation. So we're trying to lengthen the breath so that the inhalation and the exhalation take the same amount of time. And by closing the throat, that's going to create a sound that doesn't have to be audible, you know, to the whole room, but you can hear it. And you always use that, that sound as a gauge when you're practicing as well. You want to keep the breath nice and calm. You shouldn't have the goal of this breath be everyone else around you. Uh, uh, like it's a, uh, like, like to... they should know that you're breathing with sound because it can create too much heat and can be too much restriction that you're creating. Uh, we close and kind of restrict the flow of the air because we want to even out our inhales and exhales, which by the way, isn't how we breathe in our everyday life where, when we're not aware of our breath. So evening out of the breath is done through this and also it allows us not to um, fill up our lungs full of air or exhale all of the air out either. We don't do that in the practice. We kind of keep it um, in a somewhere mid yeah. in the mid-range. Yeah. And so this is really important to remember because sometimes we assume taking a full deep breath with doing the breathing correctly, but that can very quickly overwhelm us 
uh, or more specifically overwhelm our nervous system. Yeah, the objective as we move through the asanas and the vinyasas is to maintain an equanimous mind. You want to keep being able to step back into your presence, into your awareness, uh, so that you can see everything else that's happening, right? You watch everything in the field of awareness. So that's the connection we keep trying to make. If our breath gets out of our control, it's very difficult to maintain equanimity. Um, the saying is, where the breath goes, the mind goes. So we try to keep the breath nice and calm to help us keep our mind calm to our approach. So this is the technique, free breathing with sound, that we want to practice, but we need the bandhas to influence the breath, to gently influence it. And um, a couple other tips with free breathing with sound. There's no set um, count for it. It doesn't have to be four second inhale, four second exhale, or anything like that. But you do want your own inhalation and exhalation to be more or less even. So you breathe, you do you. You breathe your lung capacity, right? What's comfortable, what works. Everybody in the room can breathe their own breath. That's the beauty too of self-practice in the Ashtanga tradition. But, um, but you do want to lengthen it slightly. Slightly. And then you'll notice that the way you start your practice and the way you do your sun salutation A, the breath stays um, if you've been practicing for a little while. If, if you're new to practice, then sun salutation A is also very difficult and challenging. But eventually what you'll start to notice is that the breath you have at the start of your practice isn't going to be the exact same breath that you um, have when we do, let's say, a boat pose, Navasana. There you'll notice your breath is going to speed up, and that's fine. But we still want to make sure that as this breath speeds up, that the inhale and exhale of this new, faster breath are still even. Yeah. That's what makes it even. Not uh, making sure at all costs that the breath is exactly the same throughout the whole practice. No. Well, that'd be great too, but pretty hard. <laughs> um, but And even just attempting to keep the breath even is you paying attention to your breath, right? Uh, and a, a couple of last tips when you're doing this breath is obviously um, you don't want to breathe through your mouth. You're breathing through your nose. So your lips stay sealed, but don't clench your jaw. Try to let the biting surface of the teeth come slightly apart. Uh, one way that I do this is I rest the tip of my tongue on the roof of my mouth, just lightly, so that I can relax around the jaw. And I find that helps me uh, create the sound too. It makes, the, makes it sound more through the, the throat. And you don't want the sound to come from your sinuses. <laughs> we want to try to get it low um, towards the base of the throat the top of the chest. And as you get there, you might have even noticed your breath starts to influence the way your upper body um, moves as you breathe. So you'll notice your ribs kind of expanding this way and this way as well, while this here stays a bit more quiet. This is what David was referring to earlier by empowered thoracic breath. So the breath is moved up into the rib cage yeah. area. Yeah. Then you get that nice, <laughs> broad chest look after a while. If at any point you start to find yourself a little bit overwhelmed or like you need to breathe through your mouth, um, the best thing to do at that moment is to just pause for a second on the mat. Uh, maybe that's pausing in downward dog that helps kind of re-regulate our heart rate as well as our breath. Or if downward dog is still a challenging pose, then just coming down onto your knees like though David's doing right now and just calming yourself down, re-establishing sort of more um, neutral uh, breath and then going back into whatever you're doing. If you want to see this breath in action, if you want to try it out while you're practicing, then you can check out our um, beginners. Um, and we have a half primary and a full primary video. So th these are all places where you can start to put this to work. So it's not just, it's not just theory, right? Um, and, uh, and try it out. Let us know what you think. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks so much for staying with us for all of this, <laughs> all this talk about your pelvic floor and your lower belly. And remember, if you like the video, uh, press the little button, like it, uh, subscribe, yeah. uh, comment, let us know. 
Um, and we'll see you again soon. Bye.